So on today's special episode of a Neo News Today video, we have Harry Pearson from NGD Enterprise sharing some great work that he's recently put into a new tool for the Neo Developer Blockchain Toolkit called Neo Trace. So we have Brett and myself, editors at Neo News Today, chatting with Harry today. So thanks a lot for coming to join us, Harry. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, so just to kick this off, I know that a lot of people who watch this are developers and a lot of people who watch this aren't going to be developers. So could you just kind of like explain like I'm five, Eli five, what Neo Trace is and why this is a big deal and why you're so proud of it? So if you go back, if we click in here and we bring up the Neo debugger GitHub repo, if you go to the issues and we look at closed issues, the Almost the earliest GitHub issue that was filed in, actually it was the earliest. The earliest issue filed on the debugger was, I want to be able to debug a transaction on mainnet or testnet. This was the very first bug uh, somebody external from my team uh, filed on the debugger. And it turns out this is obviously a really important problem, right? I need to be able to, you know, you deploy your contract into production and something happens that you don't expect how do you figure out what's going wrong? How do you debug it? Now, it's great to be able to debug locally. It's great to be able to use Neo Express, but you know, the thing that makes it the ability to debug on mainnet or testnet so important is that the data is not going to be the same as what you're running locally. So sometimes you deploy a contract and because of certain operations that have occurred before, what you think is going to work a certain way doesn't work that way. So you need a way to be able to debug in the context of the blockchain, of the you know the production blockchain of mainnet of testnet, but you can't really attach a debugger conveniently to the blockchain. You can't pause the blockchain while you debug it. So we introduced some technology into the Neo debugger and Neo Express quite a while ago that we call time travel debugging. Mm -hmm. This allows mm -hmm. us to capture a trace as you execute. So you run the, the 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 contract and it spits out a file that you know it's basically a snapshot of the state of the virtual machine of the Neo VM before and after every step. And this has been built into Neo Express for quite some time, but we needed a way to be able to actually capture this information on mainnet or testnet. Because of some changes that came with Neo uh, three, ver version 3.0.3, .3, which was very recently released on mainnet, we can now actually do this locally. I can actually create that, that time travel debug trace file on my machine for any block on any public network that exists. So on mainnet, on testnet, if you're running your own testnet, you can uh, trace that, it doesn't really matter. It just, as long as you have this, the, the new state service running in full archive mode, you can actually take a trace of any public network, create that trace file, and then you can run that trace file inside the debugger so that you can see what's actually happening. You can see how much gas you're consuming. You can see the state of your, of your variables. The full debugger experience on a transaction that occurred on mainnet at some point in the past or on testnet or you know, any public network. Cool. So, I noticed in, in our coverage that um, Edge had said, had highlighted this is a new command line developer tool and one of my buddies who is just getting interested in uh, developing on blockchain now, after I've been talking to him about it for four years, said that he likes sort of lower level um, CLI sort of development areas. So is there a reason why you went with a command line tool as opposed to something higher level that's in um, like an IDE or something like that? So I, I tend to be a very big believer in, um, John and Pung will tell you that I, I go on about this a lot, uh, the, the, the Lego approach, right? I wanna be able to build small blocks and big, build bigger things out of them. I take that approach inside of a project and I take that approach across multiple projects. So you see this today in the Neo blockchain toolkit. The debugger, sits on top of some library code that's shared with Neo Express. We actually have a project called the Blockchain Toolkit Library, and that has all the shared code. We'll see a little bit of that today in, as part of this podcast. You see this also with the Neo, uh, the visual dev tracker. 
it sits on top of Neo Express. So you can use Neo Express by itself, or you can explore the the uh, the Neo Express blockchain using Visual Dev Tracker. This is the same kind of thing with Neo Trace. This is the lower level tool, and over time, we will likely build higher level tools like the ability to like. You could imagine, we haven't done this yet, but you could imagine the ability to select a trace inside of Visual Dev Tracker or select a block or select a transaction and say, I want to trace this. We haven't done that yet, but it makes it really simple to add that kind of a feature when the underlying like meat of the problem solution is already built, right? Building a extension to Visual Dev Tracker that says, you know, trace this block, trace this transaction, and all that that command does is fires off a command line process. Great. It also gives flexibility to the developer. Different developers work different ways. Um, I you know we've talked about this before. Uh, I used to work for Windows in, at Microsoft, and Windows is an enormous project. It, it is hard for people to fathom how big it is. It's hard for me, having worked on it, to realize how big it is. I was at a, as an example, I was at a uh, internal presentation about the engineering system and the amount of data that gets moved around as part of the nightly Windows build process. It's like, imagine streaming every piece of content on Netflix every day, right? It's enormous. It is mind-bogglingly huge. It sounds like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy now. Um, so different developers work different ways. When you're in Windows, you can't really easily run all of Windows inside of Visual Studio. It just doesn't work. So I got very used to working on the command line. That's my preferred way to work. Other developers like using tools like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, um, and other tools like them. So having this flexibility of having low-level tools for developers who like those, having higher-level tools that compose the lower-level tools for the developers who want them, this way we can kind of reach everybody and we can have this really good architectural approach where we you know, put the complexity where it's easiest, like building out the Neo Trace in C Sharp, sitting on top of the same code base as the core Neo platform would be a lot easier than trying to do that, say, in JavaScript, which is what the visual dev tracker is written in. Gotcha. So anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit. Did you have more questions or should you get into the demo? Let's go on into it. Show us what you want to show us. OK. so. Um, we, there's a quick start published, and I assume we can publish the actual URLs as part of the show notes. I'm actually going to use a different project that I've recently been updating. Um, this is a uh, contract that was originally built um, uh, by Hal 9000, for those of you who know him from the, uh, from the, the Neo Discord. Fantastic guy. I, I, I love the man. Um, he built this for Neo Legacy in Python. And then I actually ported it to C Sharp about two years ago for a presentation I was doing in VS Live. And I've been kind of trying to keep it up to date, uh, but I hadn't actually updated it since Neo N3 Preview 3 or 4. So this is a really interesting project. And so I thought it would be a better illustration of using um, Neo Trace than some of the other contracts that we've done. So uh, you can see here, this is public up on GitHub. Uh, it's currently in my personal organization. Um, we're probably going to move this over to NGD Enterprise. This is just a common way where I'll do work in my own repo and then move it over into an official you know, project at some point. So uh, this URL may change, but uh, it'll, it'll just change from DevHawk to NGD Enterprise. And this contract is a, it's an escrow scenario. So the scenario is I'm going to sell my phone for say 20 Neo. So I create a listing on uh, in the contract. In fact, let's just bring this up in IDE. In fact, you can see here, I've got a comment here inside the code pointing out that this was originally from Joe, Pal 9000's actual name. Um, and then I ported it over to C Sharp. So inside of this project, we'll, we'll look at the code in more detail later, but the first operation is create sale. So I'm gonna create a sale for like, I'm gonna sell my phone for say 10 Neo. When I do that, what I have to do is I actually have to deposit 20 NEO into the contract, twice the selling price. Then let's say, Dylan, you want to buy it. So you deposit 20 NEO. So we've each deposited twice as much NEO as we're actually selling the item for. 
that is an incentive since we have all this extra neo being held in escrow that's an incentive to complete the process completely uh, mm -hmm. correctly so first we create a sale then the the buyer deposits money for to, to buy it and then the seller ships it and and confirms that they ship it via the the contract and then when it's actually received by uh, this the, by the buyer they confirm receipt and at that point the contract will transfer um, 10 of the 20 neo that the buyer um, uh, deposited and the entire 20 plus the 10 of the sale price back to the seller so in this context you would get 10 neo back and i would get my original 20 neo plus your 10 neo for buying the phone now the business logic of this right that was the the original sample there's probably if this was going to be a real production contract you'd probably want to have some ability for a human to mediate like oh we want to cancel this so everybody gets back their neo that isn't implemented but yeah we did implement I, I try to be really good about every sample having a, a real world um, deploy and update mechanism. So this is actually almost exactly the same as what you have in other samples like the registrar sample. So when the contract gets deployed, the person who deploys it saves the, uh, uh, we, we save that, uh, that account information and then that account can update the contract. So this is pretty standard boilerplate stuff. So um, What's kind of cool about this contract is it demonstrates, you know, how you do real world NEP 17 payments. You'll notice that I showed here a few minutes ago, there's a buyer deposit function and there's a create sale function, but those are both called from on NEP 17 payments. So the way that you actually invoke this is that you send some NEP 17 payment to the contract. Uh, I've been using NEO as an example, but this actually would work with any NEP17 uh, compatible token. So you can use Gash, you can use NEO, you can use some third party uh, uh, token that's running on the NEP, uh, on the NEO uh, N3 blockchain. It doesn't really matter. You as the, as the seller get to decide what uh, token you're using to charge. Okay. So I've actually already deployed this. So if we go to say Dora, for those of you who haven't seen it, this is the, the, the Dora the Explorer from COZ. It's a great uh, uh, update to their um, NEO blockchain explorer. It supports NEO N3 and N, uh, NEO legacy. And in fact, if we look here, you can see here, safe purchase. This was me deploying this, uh, oh, yesterday, go figure. So I can actually see that I've actually deployed this and I've invoked it. Um, I've actually invoked it twice. I don't know why this is only showing once, but I've actually invoked this um, on the, the blockchain. In fact, if we go and we look, um, I don't see, I guess there's not a way to actually list it. I happen to know, let me just go get these off the top of this convenient file. I've actually saved off the transactions where I have invoked it. This transaction, you can see here, I've actually, you, you can't, I mean, it's the same value, bear with me, you can't really tell that, but you can see here that this event here says new sale. Uh, it's a little hard to read that. Um, this is an event that gets raised by the, uh, by the contract when a sale is created. So this is an execution of that create sale um, operation from that contract. Mm -hmm. I have another transaction where I've attempted to invoke the create sale, but I have failed. So in this example, you'll see that there's an exception. Um, seller deposit must be two times the price. If we go back and look at the code, we can see here at the top of create sale, there's that exception. So in this example, I have, so I've invoked this contract on the blockchain twice, once successfully, and once where I set the amount and the price incorrectly. So the amount is how much NEO I actually sent. The price is the, uh, the value that I was actually trying to set to sell it. Um, so you can imagine that I've, I've, uh, I've got a, uh, the ability to say, well, my contract my, it didn't execute the way I was expecting. I'd like to be able to debug that and be able to see what that looks like inside the debug. So let's trace this up. So I'm gonna open up a command line window this out here um let's uh do this real quick so as you can as we saw a second ago each of these contracts uh each of these contract executions has a, you know it's a normal transaction so therefore it actually has a transaction identifier and i'm just going to copy and paste that 
directly out of the uh, out of the URL just because it's convenient to get from there. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say, whoop, I'm going to actually put this on the execution environment and in my terminal. .NET Neo Trace TX the transaction hash and this is running on testnet. By default, it's going to look to trace from mainnet and I want to trace from testnet. So I take it a second and it'll complete. And today, please. There we go. We finished. Now, if I come back over here, we'll notice that there's a file now here on the disk that wasn't there before. This is uh, this is the the, the, the naming uh, the naming convention is to use the transaction hash. So it's this big long hash. That hash matches this hash here, and then dot neo trace. This is a binary file, so you can't really view it inside of your IDE. Um, but it's a it's a it's using a format called message pack, which is like JSON, but much more compact uh, for being able to capture. And again, this captures the state of the blockchain of the of the the Neo virtual machine after every individual step. So we can be able to, we'll be able to walk through this in the debugger. We can also create the one for the well, while we're out of here. Let's uh, go through and do the same thing. Trace TX, and we'll use the, uh, the 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 operation that actually succeeded. So what this is actually doing is it's creating a. We'll, we'll walk through the code for how this all works in a few minutes. But Neo Trace is sitting on top of a data uh, provider. Neo has an extensible data provider um, platform. So typically, that's used for being able to. You know, I want to use level DB to store the, the data. I want to use rocks DB to store the data. So it allows you to have multiple different data backends, different implementations. What we've done here is we're actually building a data uh, repository, a, a data store. It's called a read only store in, in, in Neo's code base that's pulling the data from the state service. And we'll talk more about how this is all implemented in a few minutes, but it allows us to actually get the view of the blockchain at a specific block height. So all NeoTrace is doing is it's saying, okay, great. I'm going to go off, figure out what block this transaction is in. I'm going to download that block and I'm going to execute every transaction in that block in order. And I'm going to create a trace file for the transaction that's being asked for. I can also just as a quick aside, I can also trace out an entire block. So I can either trace out by block or by transaction. And as you can see here, I apparently have a bug because I have not done the description here. Oops. Um, I will remember to do that. Anyway, but the whole point of this is it allows me to create this kind of a local trace file. So now I have these two trace files that are sitting on the disk. I'm now going to go into my, my launch configuration. So I've got the, I just realized I do not actually have the debugger installed. One second. As you can imagine, um, most developers are going to actually have the debugger installed on their machine. I, of course, because I am working on the debugger, don't usually have the debugger actually installed. So um, I'm going to run it from my local code. This, this, I'm running the same code that's running on production. I just let me just bring up a new version of it here. Okay, so. I know it looks exactly like it looked a second ago, but you can tell up here. Well, maybe you can't because of the uh, of the the Zoom stuff. Extension developer host, development host. I'm running. This is an instance of Visual Studio Code running under the debugger of Visual Studio of the Neo debugger. So again, I just have done this because I don't normally have the debugger from the marketplace installed because I'm usually working on it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so in Visual Studio Code, you can define one or more configurations for how to actually run your contract uh, under the debugger. And so you can see here, these are ones that have a type of Neo contract. Anything that has a type of Neo contract is a Neo smart contract debugger um, launch configuration. And most of these are fairly traditional uh, approaches. There's an invoke file, there's a Neo express information, there's information about the, the path to the actual compiled file. Uh, you can run on top of a checkpoint. This is all the normal way that you would typically use this. If we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see here that there's one called trace and one called trace two. And these look a little bit different. So here we're specifying 
the New York Express file. We're specifying a checkpoint. We're specifying the signer of the contract that's being uh, debugged. And we're specifying an invoke file. An invoke file is just a JSON file that allows you to very easily specify the arguments for an operation. So here's an example of a uh, of invoking the um, the buyer deposit. Right. So I'm doing a transfer to the Neo token. Uh, I'm using the Neo token because, of course, I'm I'm invoking Neo token and I'm transferring Neo to this contract. So I'm transferring from buyer to safe purchase. I'm sending a hundred. I'm invoking the buyer deposit operation, and this is the ID of the sale, right? If we look at the create sale, you see the same kind of thing where we're doing a transfer to Neo. This is coming from the seller. We're invoking safe purchase. We're uh, we're depositing 100 Neo, and we're creating a sale. The item is going to cost 50. It's called a widget, and again, this is just an identifier. The identifier can, in this specific contract, the identifier can be calculated, or you can specify it. For development purposes, it's much easier to specify it. So that's what I've done here. Anyway, so um, when we look at the launch configuration, these are the more traditional launch configurations. This is where I'm going to actually run the contract locally in an instance of the NEO blockchain that gets sort of munged up on uh, on run uh, to run for the debugger. We, we create sort of a stub blockchain uh, to run the contract in. But for Trace, we actually declare it differently. We don't specify Neo Express, we don't specify Checkpoint, and we specify a trace file. And so this is basically just a path to that trace file that we just generated. So you can see here, uh, trace, this is the one that succeeded, trace two is the one that failed. So we'll, we'll, we'll walk through both of those here in the debugger in a minute. So this is basically just a path to that Neo trace file. And I've just put it in the root of the workspace folder. So I'm using this special token, dollar sign workspace folder, and then just the name of the file. Um, so now I can go to the debugger and I can say, hey, let's let's trace this. So now I'm going to run this. And this is the normal debug experience that you get, just the same as if you were running the actual contract locally in that stub Neo blockchain. But now we're replaying it out of that trace file. Let's close a couple of these things down here. And so we're going to receive a net payment. Now, the thing that's interesting here is because this contract is holding Neo, it's also been eligible for gas distribution. So what's about to happen here is this is actually, if we look here, oh no, this is, oh no, this is the correct one. I take it back. So um, we have this code here to check to make sure that this isn't, oop, I go too far, sorry about that. This here is to check to see whether this is a gas distribution from the platform instead of a sale. So um, obviously if the, if the platform is providing gas to the contract, we don't want to do anything other than just accept the gas. So I can now step through this and I can do all my data validation. So we're checking to make sure all the data validation is correct. We can see that the command matches create sale. So we're going to verify that that information is correct. We're going to grab the price. We're going to grab the description and we can see all this information here in the debugger. Um, for example, we can see here description. This is, looks like a hex string, but if I can now add it to the watch window, um, let's get rid of this one. We do not need that. So we still see this, but we happen to know that this is a string. So I'm going to edit this expression and put string. And now we can actually see that it, we're telling the debugger, okay, don't show it this as a byte string, show it to us as a string, the mm -hmm. description. So we can actually see this here correctly. So we're able to get all this kind of information. This is the normal kind of debugger experience that you've always had with Neo Debugger. You'll notice, however, by the way, that we have some extra buttons up here, right? So this is the step over and this is the step in, but this is, and step out, but this is step back. And this is reverse where this is continue. So because this is a trace file, because we're not actually executing the problem, the program directly on top of a virtual machine, we can actually walk backwards and forwards through the trace file. So we can actually walk backwards, taking individual steps. We can rewind all the way back to the beginning and start again. So that's one of the benefits. This is why we call it time travel debugging, because you can walk back and forth through the execution. That's a, just a natural feature of using a trace file debugging instead of using an actual virtual machine. Microsoft has time travel debugging for uh, their debugger uh, WinDBG. And again, it works the same basic way. It captures a trace of execution and then plays that trace back inside the debugger. 
anyway, so this is the successful, um, I believe this will be the, yeah, this will be the successful transaction. So we'll step into, into uh, create sale. We're gonna, again, validate. You'll see here that we're grabbing which token, the, the, the hash of the token from the calling script hash, because the calling script hash, you transfer the, the this is just the way the Neo platform works. You transfer to, to the, you say, I'm gonna transfer Neo to this contract, and then it invokes the on NEP 17 payment and the calling script hash will be the token that it did. So in this case, it happens to be the NEO token. It could have been gas. It could have been some third party NEP 17 contract. I'm just using NEO here. Of course, this is testnet. So they're not real NEO and real gas. This has you know, been distributed to me via the test faucet. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice here, and this is just sort of general code for you know smart contract code. If I've provided the sale ID, it will be it won't be null. But I check to make sure that it's a 16-bit um, byte stream. If it if it isn't provided, I create a hash. So I take the seller, the price, the description, and a random value that's generated. You know, it's unique per block, like using the block index, so that I could actually create a, a unique hash for this specific sale on this specific block height. And then I do what this is kind of standard neo blockchain kind of stuff that we're going to see here right so i'm going to create a sales uh, storage map i'm going to go and check to make sure that this sale doesn't already exist and so we can see here that the serialized sale is null so it doesn't exist already i'm going to create a new sales info where i save all this information i'm going to save that to the storage map i'm also saving this information to what's called an account map this is like an index where we're keeping the information about the seller and the sale so we can later go through and say hey Give me a list of all the things that are for sale by this specific seller, right? And we can do that in a quick way without having to look through every single item. We can just look through the account map that are prefixed with the seller. And then finally, we're going to raise the on new sale event and we'll see it show up here. You can see here that we've had um, some debug console operations show up here in the window. As I step over this one, we'll see that the safe purchase new sale event has occurred. And in fact, if we go and we look at this information, it's going to match the um, well, not this one. It was this was it was this transaction. We'll see that it. Which contract is this? Uh, here, here it is. Um, we'll see that this information. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. This is the information about the new sale that occurred. And it matches the information here. It's encoded slightly different. This is hex and this is base 64 encoded, but it's the same data. And in fact, if I, uh, that's a string, I won't do it. We can see here that the value is five. So this data here that's reflecting what actually occurred on testnet matches this information, which is occurring in the trace file that I created here locally on my machine. And then we keep going, we'll just step out and we're finished. So now let's look at the other trace file where the failure occurred. So now I do the same thing. And um, this time, so I, I, I realized I've got the naming, I just realized I've got the naming wrong inside of this, uh, inside of this um, contract. Trace two actually occurred before trace. So trace two did not receive any gas distribution because at that point in time, the contract had no, was not holding any NEO. Now it is. So now I'm receiving a small amount of gas as, as for the, um, uh, because I'm, I'm holding NEO and blocks have occurred. So because of that, I'm gonna ignore this. This isn't a, uh, I'm just gonna ignore this first one. But as I keep stepping, it'll then go back and it'll, I'll, I'll, it'll call me again to the actual payment. And I hit play by accident, sorry, let me, uh, let's keep going here. I meant to hit step in. So now when we step through the code, again, we're gonna go through, it's gonna parse out all the data like it did before, and it's gonna create a step into create sale. And now it's gonna check the amount. And you can see over here in the debug window, the amount is five and the price is five. Well, the amount is supposed to be 10 if the price is five. So we're now gonna step in and throw an exception. And we can see this information here at the bottom that shows the engine state fault and the amount of gas that was consumed by this transaction. 
So we get that same kind of debugging experience that we would get locally, but now we're doing this for a project that actually occurred, an execution that occurred on a public network, in this case, testnet. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, Ed, you made a comment about this the other day when we were talking about this. One of the things you'll notice that occurs here in the watch window is that there's a, that these are the local variables and these are the storage, right? So this is just the normal contract storage, but there's also this value for engine. Mm -hmm. So this will give you a running trace of how much gas is consumed by your contract in every operation. And this occurs um, both locally and with trace files. So we're actually capturing the trace information, we're capturing the gas consumption information on a step-by-step -step basis. So every time we step through every piece of code, uh, we can see how much gas was consumed. We can also, by the way, like the debugger, we can switch into the, the um, we can switch into the Neo VM bytecode view. So this is the, 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 the underlying uh, disassembly view. So these are the Neo bytecodes that are occurring and we can step through these individually and see how that all occurs. Again, these are all the same kind of things you can do locally. The idea here is that you get the exact same experience in the debugger, regardless of whether you're working on a trace file or on a live execution of your contract that's running locally. Uh, and as you can see here, we've added a bunch of comments so that you can see, you know, what code matches what, um, what, you know, what line of code matches the following pieces of, of bytecode. By the way, this also allows you, because you've got this view, you, you, you can actually trace out literally any contract in the plot, you know, that's executed. But if you don't have the source code, if you don't have the debug information, you can't get this view. But you can always get this view. You can always look at the the, the disassembly view of your code of, of any contract as it's executing on the blockchain via the trace. And again, you also still have that same step backwards and forward type of view. Uh, I hit the wrong button, so it stepped out. It's not what, quite what I meant to do. Ah, no, no. Go back here. So I can step forward and I can step backwards through this view as well, same way. So that's a quick view of NeoTrace. A couple of other quick things. Um, as, uh, as Dylan mentioned, this is distributed as a, uh, as a command line tool and .NET specifically supports um, the distribution of these tools um, that are, can be installed globally on your machine or locally. And so you can see here in the safe purchase, we have this folder called config.config. And there's a file called .NET tools. So this file basically specifies how it gets a variety of different command line tools that this repo uses. Neo Express, if you're following this podcast, you're probably familiar with Neo Express, the local blockchain developer tool. NCCS is the Neo C Sharp compiler and Neo Trace is here as well. So the way that this actually gets installed, if I can bring up my terminal again, um, because this file exists, I can say .NET tool restore, and it will go through. Now, of course, I've already installed these, so they are already available. I can also install them globally on my machine. Like if I say Neo Trace, just like by itself, it doesn't know what it actually is. So if I say .NET tool install neo.trace.g for global, then it's going to actually install the Neo Trace tool globally on the machine. It's having to download it and do all that kind of stuff. And some of the bandwidth that I have right now is going to the video podcast or the video trace. So this takes a second. So now I can say Neo Trace and it's installed globally on the machine. So I can access it from anywhere. Different people, again, we're back to that concept of flexibility we were talking about before, Dylan. Some people want to just install the tool globally on their machine especially since I'm oftentimes working with different versions of these tools because I'm working on as a core developer, I usually tend to use the local versions of the tools. Plus from the perspective of a sample like this, it makes it really easy for me to actually just have a launch task. So in fact, if you look at the launch tasks, we actually have a restore tools to one that'll just do that, that .NET tool restore. And this is dependent for the build. So every time you go to do a build, it checks to make sure the tools are up to date. So if you as a developer check out this repo, it will automatically make sure that the tools are configured correctly so that it can build the contract with NCCS. It can automatically um, um, construct a local blockchain with Neo uh, Express and 
I don't have a task for this yet, but I'm going to create some tasks here that will automatically create the trace files uh, for you as well. So that way you don't have to enter them here on the command. So what do you guys think so far? I think it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, I had a little play around with your um, the the sample repository that you put up. Um, the registrar sample, yeah. Yes, it was a registrar one, um, and it all worked beautifully with uh, with the .NET Restore. Obviously, personally, I prefer to have them globally installed. Uh, but as you say, yeah, it's, no. it's all about the choice. Yeah. Well, and again, especially because I don't, as a sample repo, I don't want to be, I don't want to be making changes to your global machine state for sure. specific to the sample. So. Yeah. For the samples I do, I always use local tools. And again, because I'm oftentimes working with different versions of the tools, um, I also tend to use uh, the, the same way that I had to, like, I didn't, I don't actually have the debugger installed by default because if I have the debugger installed by default, it will conflict with, you know, when I'm working on making updates and improvements to the debugger, they conflict. So I tend to not actually have the debugger installed locally. I run it the way I'm running it now. You know, I mean, like if I go here to extensions, it'll show up. It should show up. Oh, maybe it doesn't show up because it isn't a uh, because it isn't actually. Yeah, I guess it doesn't because it's not actually installed as a package. Uh, but obviously, you know, we obviously were able to debug, so it's obviously working. Um, but uh, that, that's just you know. Because of the this, the nature of my job, it, I don't tend to actually have the tools installed, so that way I can easily install them at any time. Hmm. So, I want to talk a little bit about how this works under the hood. Now, you know, obviously, as a developer, all the stuff that I've shown you up until this point, that's what you kind of need to know. The stuff I'm about to show you is, I think, really fascinating. Oh, excuse me, and interesting, but isn't really important to know. Like knowing how it works is fun and you know, it can be useful, but it isn't required in order to be able to use the tools, right? You know how to install it, you know how to run it, you know how to, you know, to, you know, to see it and to be able to debug with it and configure Visual Studio Code correctly. That's all you really need. But if you want to know how it works under the hood, I'm kind of excited about it. So I'd like to talk about it. Show us how so, the sausage is made. Yeah, let's do some sausage.